We are here in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we are anxiously waiting for Tropical Storm Isaias. So here we are, it's the end of July, I'm back from Arizona, and so far the hurricane season has been every bit as busy as we thought it would be. I mean, we just had Hannah in the Gulf of Mexico, I think we can all agree that was an overachieving system, but now, a lot of people on social media talking about this new system coming off Africa, this very large tropical wave, maybe it's gonna impact the Lesser Antilles first, you know, the Northeast Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and perhaps, eventually even Florida. And this was a situation where we had a very large and vigorous tropical wave emerge from Africa and move off to the west into very favorable conditions. It just looked like trouble and it eventually was going to develop. The problem was nobody really knew how to pronounce the name. You have to understand, we name storms for a reason, to keep up with what is what. So the, the names are chosen by the uh, Hurricane Committee uh, for Region 4 of the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, it meets on an annual basis. And, you know, names are selected from both uh, English, Spanish, and French uh, dialect. Isaias, uh, <laughs> Isaias what? And being Brazilian, I thought it was really funny that people couldn't pronounce Isaias. And it's not always gonna be Cindy, Bob, or Anna. Sometimes you have these names like Isaias. And it really didn't matter how people pronounced it. It looked like, I think the main point here is that it was gonna be a problem for somebody. And eventually the Southeast United States. But how close, how strong, when that was gonna happen, that certainly remained uh, a big question. And so I was talking to Brent about it constantly in communication with him. Do you want to come up to the lower 48 out of the Virgin Islands and, and be here for it? And, you know, remembering Dorian in 2019, he was kind of like, mm, I don't think so. Those recurves, you got that potential for a recurve. So, you know, it could be it could be a 50-50. Next thing you know, you're driving the Rodanthe to the end of the earth to catch the last of it, the last possible place. Well, the early indications were that Isaias would come through the Northeast Caribbean and eventually affect Florida in some form or fashion. Again, you just don't know how strong or when or exactly where, but you know, I figured any threat to Florida, I wanna be there. I wanna make sure I'm there for that. Mike was available, so off we went. Mark says he wants to put his first camera in Marineland, Florida, which is just south of St. Augustine on the East Coast. And we head south on, on 95, and then we're just driving and driving and driving. Finally get there maybe four, three, four o'clock in the morning, something like that, really late. Yeah, so I knew exactly where this first camera location would be down there near Marineland. Brent and I were there in 2019 setting up a camera for Dorian. You know, we talk about Dorian a lot, and the reason is these parallels here were pretty striking, with the one big exception, of course, that Isaias was not gonna be nearly as strong as Dorian, at least we hoped not. All right, let's get this, this camera strapped down and get out of here and from out of nowhere these bugs the, this massive infestation of bugs of biblical proportions descended upon us i don't even know what they were yeah sometimes you never know what you're going to encounter out there when we set up one of these cameras especially in florida and especially in the middle of the summertime but we got it done we went over to the hotel after that in palm bay got some sleep and we were ready to go later on that saturday to set the second camera up in the vero beach area here we are, Mike and I, August 1st, Saturday. We're gonna go set up a camera up on the bridge here going over the Intracoastal Waterway on the way over to Vero Beach. Should have a good view. Isaias is weakening, but still should have some pretty good impacts. 
as we get ready for the ramping up of the season from here on out. And what happened was is since the storm was battling some wind shear and Florida was on the western side, it was on the dry side and we really didn't see too many significant impacts into the peninsula as the storm moved off towards the north and ultimately Florida dodged a bullet with EIS. We had two cameras set up along the east coast of Florida. I was very happy about that. You know, we wanted to make sure we had it covered just in case, but it was clear now that EIS was going to be much more of a threat to the Carolinas and maybe even as a hurricane. Yeah, EIS was in an unfavorable environment in the Bahamas. It was encountering wind shear that kept the storm rather disorganized. As it was expected to approach the Carolinas in two to three days, the conditions were gonna become more favorable. You've got the warm Gulf Stream waters. You've also got a, uh, the wind shear is going to relax as it approaches the Carolinas. Those two factors should allow the storm to intensify and develop an inner core that is sort of lacking at this point in the Bahamas. That's a little breezier today. Yep. A little bit more gray hurricane sky. So it's now Sunday, the 2nd of August, and it's clear that we need to get back north and set up equipment for Isaias in my neck of the woods in southeast North Carolina and vicinity. So once again, it's time to hit the road. Lucky for me, I had Mike to help out with the driving. I mean, the thousands, the, the hundreds of thousands of miles that Mark has clocked in the last 20 years it's just remarkable to me that he's just able to keep going because I saw firsthand what it was like. Uh, just First of all, just the hours on the road, the three o'clock, the four o'clock in the morning driving through Nowheresville, uh, the bad drivers, uh, the uh, bad uh, weather, of course. The dude is driving into hurricanes uh, and many times the, the bad food. It just, it, I mean, I'm just stunned that he's, able to do this mission after mission after mission on it. I know they're all just like this. And let's take a look real quick at the latest as uh, my driver there, Mike, safely gets me north on Interstate 95 here. Uh, this is what's happening with Isaias, uh, the track here up into the east coast. Big time impacts. Doesn't have to be a big hurricane to bring it big impacts. Mark started the process of lining up locations in Brunswick County, coastal Brunswick County, to where he thought the storm was going to come in. And how he does that, he reaches out to his supporters and just social media friends asking if anyone has coastal property that they would allow him to put equipment on to capture the landfall of Isaias. I heard back from several people and they were very generous in offering up their property and I'm actually able to utilize Google Earth and Google Street View right there in the vehicle while Mike is driving, checking it out on the iPad and seeing each of these locations and whether or not they're gonna work because what we wanna do is capture these impacts to the best of our ability, knowing what the impacts are gonna be. And then it dawns on me, my wife has a very good friend that has a place, a summer cottage, oceanfront on Oak Island. So I call her up, she gives us permission, there's nobody there, she says, yeah, that's fine, as long as you're not gonna damage the porch, and of course we don't, we just strap, strap them down, and you know, we're off on our way. And that's exactly what we did. We got to the beaches of Brunswick County, we set up these two camera systems, and it was easy. And it was easy because we had people who supported what we were doing by giving us permission to use their property right there on the waterfront, so it made the process very easy. We didn't have to waste any more time. Remember, we are now about 24 hours out from what would eventually become Hurricane Isaias. After working basically all night, Mike and I set out three cameras and a weather station along the coast there in Brunswick County. And as the dawn came in and the sun started to come up, Isaias was really looking like it was on a strengthening trend probably going to become a hurricane that night before making landfall so time was definitely starting to run out. In an ideal situation we'd like to provide 36 to 48 hours uh, lead time to get the hurricane or tropical storm watches up. The schedule was a little bit compressed in this case here but we were still able to get those products up well ahead of the storm. We had hurricane warnings up uh, 24 to 36 hours before the winds actually reached the south and North Carolina coast. I wasn't quite done yet after just a couple of hours of downtime Mike and I got out there once again 
went down to Carolina Beach and wanted a camera there. And then we went over to the downtown Wilmington area. I also wanted a camera system right along the Cape Fear River in case there was any storm surge that happened to work its way up the river. All in all, this was really good coverage, I felt like, for a situation that we really weren't sure about. Is this going to really become a hurricane? What are the impacts going to be? It's probably going to happen at night. You know, we just felt like, hey, at least we got some stuff up. We will see what happens. And it's interesting, though, because it turns out we weren't the only ones out there setting up equipment. But I knew another professor here at ENCW who uh, had done deployments for Dorian and Florence on Masonboro Island. So I knew he was already going to be going out there. Um, and so we met up, got on a boat. It was like the last boat that we could take out before we had to dock everything up uh, and installed uh, three pressure sensors in a cross shore transect from sort of like the mid beach up to the dune toe. But I wanted to capture like the wave transformation and the surge right across the barrier island. And the problem was Isaias continued to get better organized. It looked a lot better on satellite, on radar. Recon was confirming that the pressure was dropping and it looked like it was going to continue this process all the way up to landfall. A trend that we have seen quite often in these last few years. One of the concerns we had was of course storm surge which did develop along the southeastern coast of North Carolina into the Myrtle Beach area of South Carolina. Even though the storm was not initially well organized in the Bahamas, as it approaches the coast of the Carolinas and the inner core does intensify some, we're going to see along and east of the center where the winds are onshore a storm surge develop. The North Carolina outer banks and the North Carolina coastline is so complex uh, that really small changes in intensity the radius of maximum winds of the storm, as well as uh, where it makes landfall, can have huge differences on what, what actual part of the coastline gets those, uh, uh, the peak storm surge. And it's one reason why we tell people not to you know, compare previous storms with, with, with current storms, because each one's gonna be different. I think a lot of people were gonna be taken by surprise, especially along the beaches of Brunswick County. I don't think that people fully understood the impacts that were coming from this hurricane this situation. I mean, even at my house in the Wilmington area, the wind was already starting to knock the power out as this strengthening hurricane was starting to come ashore. And then there's this concern for tornadoes, and it seemed like Isaias was just cranking them out. We're in that right front quadrant of the storm. The winds are swirling in such a way that updrafts within, within these uh, showers and thunderstorms tend to rotate, and that's where we see the tornado threat typically be highest. In Isaias, we did see uh, half a dozen tornadoes across southeastern North Carolina and northeastern South Carolina. One was an EF2 with 115 mile an hour winds that moved from Baldhead Island to Southport, North Carolina, it caused quite a bit of damage in downtown Southport. This is it, time's running out. Isaias is going to make landfall as an intensifying hurricane right where I live in the Wilmington, North Carolina area, Southeast North Carolina, generally. Uh, I had sent my family inland. I didn't want them to have to deal with that, especially a strengthening hurricane. That's a lot different animal than you know one that's coming ashore in steady state or certainly one that is weakening. I figured too, since it's gonna be making landfall at night, I really wasn't sure what the camera systems were gonna see. And uh, these nighttime events, you just never know. So I decided I will go up to Roanoke Rapids, which is up by 95, near the Virginia, North Carolina border, and try to see what the impacts were up there, especially if this were to come up that way during daylight hours. It's about 11 o'clock Eastern time and I arrived at the hotel just in time to watch these cameras as Isaias is making landfall in Southeast North Carolina. Every one of them was kind of interesting in their own way. Of course, we had the weather station on top of the bridge there. That was doing great, providing some really nice wind readings and pressure readings. But it was this one camera along the west side of Oak Island that stole the show. In, in coastal impacts, we typically like think of the water level, we call it total water level, right? Um, as sort of three or four different aspects. The tide, right? Which exists without waves or wind or anything, right? Then we have on top of that, the storm surge and the two together we call the storm tide, right? And on top of all of that, it's, there's no waves, right? Uh, in, in the storm tide, but we actually in reality do have waves. And these waves, as, as soon as the dunes are breached, for example, right, and the water level is over the dunes, 
these waves are also existing and propagating into the houses and into the infrastructure, right? And that is exactly what was happening here in Oak Island, but little did we know just how dramatic it would end up being. The deck had begun to collapse and eventually it did, and the camera system still attached to the vertical post that Mike and I had strapped it to, all of that came crashing down, but here's the thing. The camera kept on streaming, and so what happened next was nothing short of being straight out of a horror movie. Now the camera box is sealed and so it obviously floats and it's also got night vision so we can see what's going on as it keeps on streaming there from underneath this house. Also keep in mind that there's a woman staying in this house. We learned about that when Mike and I had made arrangements to take the camera out there the night before. The gentleman that set it all up for us told us that there's somebody staying there so we were very careful not to disturb her the night before but now she's trapped. She can't leave even if she wants to. We were glued to our devices, I know I was. I was watching from uh, my laptop at the hotel there in Roanoke Rapids. Thousands of people were watching our online coverage. It was on the Weather Channel, full screen. You know, for minutes at a time, this drama unfolding underneath this house from this camera streaming from a perspective that we had never seen before. And the longer it went on, the more strange it became. Again, giving us this vantage point of something that is both you know dangerous and causes a lot of damage a true perspective of storm surge unlike anything we've ever witnessed The water level kept creeping up as the surge got a little bit higher. This storm surge, of course, was topped by three or four foot waves rolling in every few seconds. And what's inside of all that wave action and the water? Well, there's all this debris, household debris. We saw like a door and a washing machine and all kinds of other stuff. And that would come in, rise and fall and bang around, knocking more stuff loose. And I think what it did is it helped to underscore that there was a lot more to storm surge than just the water rise and the wave action and what we see obviously from when it's all over this showed us something different that we had to take into account for future hurricane events what we typically think of uh, when we talk about engineering and sort of structures is the freeboard and the bottom elevation of the home and then what is the top elevation of the wave crest on top of the storm tide right whatever that elevation is Okay, in, in a design, as long as your freeboard is X above that, for example, for this kind of storm, maybe you're okay, right? One thing that I really hadn't occurred in my mind or I hadn't seen physically, right, with, with video evidence is this whole concept of that you also have debris floating on top of the storm tide and the waves. And that exceeds by, a, a, in some cases, several feet um uh, the, the crest of the highest wave for example right and so even if you have a wave which you'll know is two feet below the house we might still expect structural damage because of this floating debris which is extending feet above the free surface <laughs> the washing machines refrigerators and, and cars right yeah it's crazy 
Then, to make matters worse, we started seeing sparks from the electrical outlets due to the salt water getting inside. And you gotta keep in mind the power was somehow still on down here. A very unusual situation unfolding for sure for Brunswick County. Now we have a problem with the Cape Fear River. It's rising and it looks like it's gonna spill over and into downtown Wilmington. You, you know, can get the, the water from the ocean to push up into the river and cause it to elevate. Really, the water doesn't have anywhere to go at that point. And so the water just continues to rise. And we were seeing that from the perspective of the live camera down there next to the Cape Fear River. And uh, in fact, the wind was strong enough that it actually pushed the box around, the camera box on the pole that we had mounted there. And it turns out that Isaiah set the record for the highest water level on the tide gauge there over the USS North Carolina, that's the battleship in downtown Wilmington. That record beat Matthew from just a few years prior, and that record beat uh, Hazel back in 1954. So it just goes to show you that Isaiah was a pretty significant coastal flood and storm surge event for Southeast North Carolina. Once things calmed down, I got in touch with Katie. That's the woman that stayed in the uh, house there along the west end of Oak Island. Checked on her to see how she was doing. She told me that her car was ruined. And then she also told me that she could see the yellow box, uh, the camera box underneath the house. I couldn't believe it. She said, yeah, I can see it in the rubble down there. And I you know, said, can you take a picture and send it to me? And she told me that her cell phone didn't have real good connectivity. And I guess that was understandable. And then I thought, you know, why don't you try to connect to my hotspot that's still in that box? You know, there's a long shot that it's still running. And lo and behold, it was. She was able to connect to that Verizon hotspot and actually send me all these pictures from the damage there on the west end of Oak Island. The camera box had survived, and in fact, Katie got it for me out from underneath the house there, brought it to me in Wilmington a couple of days later, and much to my amazement, it was actually in pretty good shape. Let's see here. There we go. All right, got the latches open. <laughs> here we go, let's see if I have built the ultimate box. Not bad at all, just a little bit of water inside. There's the hot spot right there, um, still running. Kind of reminds me of a very similar situation that I was facing about 15 years earlier. Almost bone dry, a little bit of water. Of course, back then it wasn't water that caused everything to fail or anything like that. It was human error. It was my fault. I had the wrong cable plugged into the recording device and as a result, we just got blue screen for nine hours instead of this amazing historic footage from Hurricane Katrina. But even all of that has evolved tremendously since then. We now have cloud recording and you know this ability to store the live video remotely, but we still have to go back and pick up the camera boxes when it's all said and done. Oh. Here we are, it's August 10th. A week after landfall, Mike and I going back to clean up. <laughs> Getting our camera box off the deck up here. Thank you, sir. So there's the rack line down there. It almost did it. Wow. This area, the east end of Oak Island, fared a lot better than the west side. That's the area where Katie's house was that she stayed in, where we saw the camera wash underneath and all that drama. Uh, and that's where the storm surge was the highest. We had a lot of automobiles that were damaged from that flooding. Uh, people were actually trapped for a couple of days because of all the sand that had washed in uh, onto the roadway over there. And in fact, it showed us how important erosion and deposition, or what we call the accretion of sand is, during an event such as a hurricane. I think it just had a lot to do with, and this has to do with the surveys that we did, right? The beach profile surveys, 
where the beach, which eroded a lot, was much steeper and much narrower. And so the waves were crashing right on that beach, chipping away little by little. Whereas the beach to the north was much wider and flatter. And so the waves were dissipating and breaking, reforming, breaking, reforming. And by the time they were getting up to the, the beach, they were much smaller and a lot of the energy had been dissipated. So one of the things Isaias in particular showed us is that even a small storm that maybe wasn't all that well organized to start with can still have significant impacts. We saw the tornadoes across Brunswick County. We saw the significant storm surge flooding across Brunswick County. So it doesn't take a category three or four storm to really have big impacts. It can take a category one, even a tropical storm can have significant impacts. Isaias ended up being one of many, many hurricanes to impact Southeast North Carolina and then eventually going up into the Northeast. And as bad as things were, especially along the beaches of Brunswick County, we know things can be worse. They can be a lot worse. Now, unfortunately, as we approach the end of August, we were gonna get a nasty reminder of exactly how bad things can get.